Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard their point. Now, hear the counterpoint on Libertarian Counterpoint Podcasts. Welcome to the Knuckleheads of Liberty Podcast, formerly the Libertarian Counterpoint Podcast. <laughs> we are coming at you on uh, Christmas Eve 2020. We are going to be interviewing uh, James Just, who ran for California Assembly District 7. Sacramento. And uh, let me introduce you now to the panelists. Up on top, you can see we have <laughs> uh, James Just. He's who we're going to be interviewing today. And uh, just below him, uh, we have Leon, the word Brathwaite, last word in liberty. And uh, just below me, we have our Screaming Eagle of Freedom, Tim Everett, who is a pilot in the state of California. And I'll be your on, host today. On, <laughs> on the bottom of the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our, our eagle's been grounded. On this show, you guys can call me Jabbering James. There you go. Jabbering James. <laughs> James. <laughs> you got me Jabbering. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, my name is James McPhee. I'll be your host today. And uh, so uh, let's uh, jump right into that interview. And you can see as well, we've got a map up uh, just so you can kind of see where this is at. It's uh, the district is in uh, Sacramento, California. And uh, but let's uh, jump into the interview. So James Just, he uh, uh, recently ran this uh, last uh, uh, November. Uh, he was on the ballot here in Sacramento and uh, he ran for, again, Assembly District 7. Uh, he's also holds a position in the uh, local uh, libertarian, uh, Sacramento Libertarian County uh, as vice chair. Uh, so with all that, um, you know, uh, he's also uh, as well, just as a disclaimer, he also uh, uh, directs our show for us as well. So uh, he's kind of got his hands in a little bit of everything <laughs> nowadays. But uh, no, we are, we are that's, yeah, that's for us to say nice things about him. <laughs> hey, it's, it's all well deserved. <laughs> but, anyways, uh, it, as far as that goes, uh, let's find out a little bit more about James and uh, his experience. So, one of the things we kind of want to do with this is we want we want to give it a chance for anybody who may be out there thinking about running for office. Be, uh, you know, uh, maybe they're sick of the way things are. Uh, they they want to figure out how they can make a change. Well, I mean, you know, the first step is to kind of find out how people who who've tried to do this and have done it, uh, you know, the steps they took. So uh, let's find out a little bit more from James about that. So James, uh, why did you decide to run for office? Well, first <laughs> I want you to point out, for those of you who can't see, but look at that map and gerrymandering is still very much alive despite the California Commission. It is, so those of you who don't know, <laughs> the, the California Redistricting Commission was supposed to solve it, but you look at that map and you know it's redistricting uh, hasn't been solved. The redistricting commission operates off of a list that the uh, legislature gives them. So the legislature still decides how maps look, whether we think he does or not, the legislature does. And my map is proof. It goes all the way from real Linda <coughs> and Alberta, which is a very rural community to downtown Sacramento. And the chunk cuts off part of Sacramento that is more relatable. And it's, they are forcing groups of people to <coughs> be represented together who don't represent, who aren't, natural natural uh communities and so you end up getting 25 percent of the people who simply don't feel heard because their representatives don't have to listen to them and we ended up with 26 percent, which is a, a going above our weight but i ran because gig workers asked me to fundamentally we, when i can remove this play my gig workers asked me to run ab5 was such a disaster and i you know i was a gig worker and i got to talk to all my fellow gig workers um a lot ride share drivers at base gig workers mainly for me they asked me to run because ab5 was disastrous and it destroyed our lives not just our incomes our our livelihoods you know a, a lot of the times we take less money so we can work the way we want and and james let me just jump right in for those of you who may not be familiar with it ab5 was an assembly bill that went into effect here at the beginning of last year uh, beginning of 2020 rather i should say and essentially it restricted people doing gig work, gig work saying that they had to be become a full-time or not necessarily full-time, but they had to become employees of the company employees. that they yeah. were working for yeah. instead of being, uh, I guess, independent contractors. It was really aimed at uh, Uber and Lyft. 
and <laughs> oddly they've they've sort of found an escape hatch now. <laughs> well, oddly enough, it wasn't aimed at Uber and Lyft. It was Uber and Lyft were the excuse to do it. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't at, if you go look at the thing, it didn't. It wasn't aimed at Uber and Lyft at all. It was aimed at all those other. It was aimed at court reporters and musicians and artists and everybody else. It's just they used Uber and Lyft as the excuse. But, but it was for your own good. They did good, exactly. Yes, I, they need. I need to be so protected from these big evil corporations that I must now have a tighter relationship with them. I yeah. don't understand <laughs> the, the thought process. Exactly. Well, you know, the, the scary thing is, is that you know, there's there's been all these different people who've looked for exemptions to AB five, and they've gotten a lot of them here in California for different right. industries, and and yet the Democrats, for all of the trouble this is making, they want to take this thing national as well. You know, it's I think they're seeing it as a way to try and unionize more people. And it's really, you talk about a, a way to restrict people from, from easily getting back into the workforce in a time when they've just shut everybody down and ruined businesses right and left. I, I can't think of a worse idea than AB5, but anyways, it, yeah. It but creates another all, barrier to the, it, to the workforce entry. The mismanagement that are going on in these blue states. This, this all, all these laws that they pass that are restricting business activity and all that sort of thing. But before we jump off here, James, I want to go back to something you said about these uh, the boundaries of, of districts, which in California is supposed to be determined by the commission. How, by you, but you're saying the uh, politicians uh, are still determining those boundaries? And how, how is that happening, then? which is a little mystifying to me to hear, because well, I, didn't, I didn't even know that was the case. Well, it, I was part of the districting commission 10 years ago, last time they did it. And I made through the first four rounds and I, I dropped out when I, when we got the list of conditions that the legislature had us working under, it was essentially a Democrat wish list of how to design a district. You go by race and gender and income rather than you, like for most people, you just common interests and natural barriers, right? That's how you draw a district. Yes. Yeah. People in Sacramento downtown, you keep them together and people in rural areas, you keep them together and you use things like rivers, freeways, you know, gorges that kind of thing as where yeah. barriers go yes and but that's not what we do we use demographic issues and racial issues and, and economic things and, oh. and and it's all based upon and you get like this list i think it was like 26 uh, criteria that you had to go through before you can design a district now they may do it differently this time i one of the things i talked to the professionals down at the professional bureaucrats <laughs> who run these things i was talking to them last year about this time last year and they've now understood that the legislature took more authority than they actually really should have had. And so yeah. maybe the professional bureaucrats, now that they know what they're doing, because they've been through the at, at once, that they can actually, you know, stand up to them some more. But essentially, the legislature tells them what the conditions they work under. So the legislature tells them what conditions they work under. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. And just more, more craziness, but it's interesting how many things you have your hands into because, you know, once again, you had some experience on this as well. Yeah, so right, it's it's right. really interesting. But, but so tell us a little bit about how you did, uh, how did, uh, w w what were the results of your, uh, uh, of, of your run? Well, we got 26%, which is actually pretty good. It's punching above our weight. We raised less than four grand. I think it was 35, 3,200 bucks. <laughs> I'll have to actually go back and look, but it was less than $4,000. And so it's 26%. Just to give you some context, other uh, libertarians that ran up here in Northern California. Now, they were in the Bay Area, so they have actually even tougher road to hoe than I did. But they got 11%. And mm -hmm. so when it comes about libertarians, we figure our floor was about 15. And so we've got about 10, 11% above our floor. Uh, that's what our figures, that's what, kind of what we figure. So, you know, punching above your weight and this kind of thing is your main goal. And is for me, it's to make sure you've made an impact. You punch above your weight. You can actually start to have create conversations. You can become a legitimate community activist, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, I'm surprised you did so well with uh, the downtown Sacramento in there. I mean, that that's got to be very uh, pro Democrat. I would. Yes, yeah, is, is Democrat the Democrat stronghold downtown uh, Sacramento is, is a Democrat stronghold. Yeah, we got hammered downtown. We did well outside of downtown. We actually oh. won. We won some districts up in Rio Linda and um, some precincts up in Rio Linda and um, Alberta. So okay. up in the rural, more rural areas, we did well. 
We also did well, oddly enough, in some of the older areas, some of the retirement communities, which actually surprised me. Yeah. So we did downtown places where the, you know, the tech and the young people and the, the yuppies back in our days, they were called yuppies. We didn't do so well the, in the millennials oh, group, oof. but people above the millennials, we punched way above our weight. And so we did okay. So James, so would, you, oh, so would you call this a moral victory in a sense? Would you call it that? I call it work. <laughs> <laughs> there's, it's not a victory. You know, victories are, you could say there's a moral victory. Yes, but it's work. I learned, I learned a lot and it tells me where to go from here. It helped me design a program for the, to get the local party moving forward. And so it, it's, you know, it's work. It, it's, it's education and it's work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. James, one of the things I wanted to ask you too is when you were running and you got these thousands of people to vote for you, uh, are, were you listed as a libertarian on there or was it, uh, do they list parties when you're running for? Yeah. Uh, okay. You was okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't That's run, I didn't do what a lot of libertarians do. They run as a libertarian. Libertarian comes out like every 10th word. I, I didn't hide from it, but I also didn't talk about it. I talked issues and solutions. I didn't actually sit around and talk a lot of political philosophy. No, wait, actually, that's, I talk a lot of political philosophy, but not party political philosophy. Let me, it's just how do we get from here to less intervention and less confusion and simplicity and ethics? You know, let's get, oddly enough, if you want the biggest issue that I ran on that I found that surprised me was transparency and ethics. Hmm. Trans, I, my transparency videos, I did a few videos on transparency and the outperformed everything else oh wow okay. so if, if for those of you out there transparency is a big thing here in california regardless of whether it's democrats republicans independents everybody likes transparency hmm. so you're saying are you saying this was the biggest issue in, in your campaign is yes you're not even it's not even close wow Transparency is the biggest issue, which essentially goes with corruption. If you look at how the state is operated, I can, oh my God. <laughs> it, in a sense, it's worse than we think, but it's also better than we think because people are fed up with it, regardless of party. They may not be willing to change the way they vote yet, but they're getting there. Well, you know, this this brings up a question that you, you mentioned that uh, you, you ran videos on uh, transparency and ethics. Uh, so I guess, you know, uh, doing, uh, I guess these were online webcast uh, videos then, or uh, what What kinds of resources, I guess, were you using to, to reach out to people? Yeah, well, Joe Biden campaigned from his basement. I campaigned from my garage. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, well, well, it was a combination of COVID it's and alleged, resources. It's, it's alleged that Joe Biden won. So, <laughs> and, uh, I don't know it's alleged that you did not, so there, there must have been some difference here. That's right. I can accept I can accept defeat. It's all good, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, well, you know, so, so it sounds like uh, you were taking full advantage of the Internet. Were there other public resources that you found useful uh, in uh, running your campaign? Well, in terms like that, it's... It's difficult to make um, judgments this year, simply because so much got thrown in the air. Our whole original campaign plan dissolved in March. We were going to use community meetings and, and use my ability to speak to the public in person. And I just had to change that to go all online. Yeah. And so in terms of like parks and the, the normal the normal campaigning, we didn't get to do, yeah. which in a sense is it actually saved us in a way because I didn't have to try to figure out how do I make 3,500 bucks do 20 different things. I got to make it do three and we focused on what we were good at and it actually paid off. So if there is a lesson to, to learn for un underfunded candidates is pick one or two things that you're already good at, focus on that and do that well, rather than try to do a bunch of things you don't do well. Uh, just, you know, pick the one or two things, focus on that, do well at that. And you can punch above your weight relatively easily. Because the environment is ripe for someone to come in and make noise. Okay. Well, you, you mentioned, uh, oh, sorry. So yeah, go ahead, Tim. No, I was just uh, wondering if he ever, James, have you ever thought about running as a, uh, a different party, like a Democrat or Republican, one of the two main parties? Have you ever even given it a thought or is it because uh, 
both parties are so far away from you, uh, philo your philosophy and the libertarian just fits in. Did you, uh, was that the overriding uh, decision making process for you <laughs> to, to run as a libertarian? Well, the short answer is I love freedom too much to run for one of the other parties. That's the short answer. <laughs> All right. The, the long answer is, is, is yeah, I'm, I'm essentially a humanist. I'm not a libertarian because I'm politically, philosophically, ideologist, ideologue. I'm a humanist, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so... You mean what? what do you mean by humanist? It's where the individual human, the rights of the individual human is what you judge all your ethical judgments on base base all your ethical judgments on it, it's okay. kind of a comic book version of humanists it's not a real version of humanists so don't no one send me letters saying that's not real <laughs> humanism i know it's, <laughs> it's it's my libertarian version of humanism it's yeah. it's where all my ethical decisions are based upon the individual human rights essentially okay. everything i do is based upon the rights of the individual human everything i think about uh, my perspective starts there and so in, in many sense, I'm okay with more government than a lot of libertarians. Not because I like big government, but it's because I accept where we are and I accept that people want it. And okay, fine. How do we get to the more libertarian future in 50, 100 years? Well, you start by the first couple steps. And the first couple steps aren't going to look like they're going to look when you're at the end of the journey. And so mm -hmm. I kind of accept that. Okay. But, but, but James, okay. Yeah. Um, the, a little philosophical point here, but if, if you're telling me that you 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 accept the government as it is, the, well, I don't accept. I accept that it exists as it is, and that the path to fixing it is a long, windy road, and it's not going to look libertarian, especially in the beginning steps. Well, I, then I'm, I'm asking then if if, if if your your ideology accept that it exists as it is, and it's not going to look very libertarian now. Is there a plan? I mean, I don't, I don't want you to get too far from where we, where, where we, what the show is about. But what is the plan to change it? I don't see anything at all about how we're going to steer this ship away from the, from, from that big iceberg that is sitting out there, which is, is, is the, 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 the rabid destruction of our individual liberties and rights. Yeah. It, well, it's it's this long, slow conversations, Leon. It's exactly what we're doing right here. It's people like me running for office, having those long, slow conversations about, you know, our individual rights are are fundamental. And, you know, you can talk about like the stimulus package or if government's going to stop people from working, then they damn well have an obligation to make sure they can feed themselves. Now, I wouldn't have stopped the people from working, but the, it happened. And so now we're going to have to figure out how to make people be able to feed themselves because, until we can they can get back on their feet. We've knocked people off their feet. It's our moral responsibility to take care of them now. Hmm. And so and it's from a humanist perspective. That's my humanist side, right? It's we force a bunch of people into extreme poverty and to the government has, has forced them. In, and so now they have an obligation to make sure that they ameliorate those effects. And so that's not going to look very libertarian at first. But in the long run, it will because people will say, okay, look, they screwed it up creating this sick of circumstance. And so we cannot not do that again, but we still have to fix it because you can't make a mess and then not fix it. Yeah. Well, yeah, James, I, I wanted to get back on the track of uh, practicality for, uh, you know, just running for office period. Mm -hmm. Suppose somebody was, you know, uh, really interested, uh, you know, they've, they've heard you talk a little bit about this and they're thinking, man, I, I'm curious about running uh, maybe as a libertarian in some other County. Where would they go to uh, start looking into what resources are available to them? I mean, uh, would they contact uh, the state Libertarian Party or their local county Libertarian Party? And what resources might they get? Well, if you're Libertarian, the, the quick answer is you can contact any of them. All the states, the Fed, the, the national or your local county can help. They can all kind of plug in. They all have different resources. Um, I know there's a playbook at the national level where you get like three years. I mean, I have my problems with that. I actually think that because all politicians run off essentially the same playbook, it actually creates, uh, accidentally creates corruption. But there is a playbook you can kind of go through. Um, you can go and talk to people who run for office, which is actually the most effective way is simply to call someone up who's run for office and talk to them about it and, and see. 
talk to a couple different people so you have different perspectives because some people get jaded after they run for office. Some people get enthused. And so you want to make sure you get a balance. <laughs> what, what, cate what category are you in? Jaded I'm in neither. I'm in neither. I'm in neither because I didn't start this the normal way. I didn't do this because I wanted to run for office. I did this because my community asked me to help. Mm. And so it, it's a different thing. It, I was literally asked to help. I wasn't going to run. This time last year, I was not going to run for office. I had decided it wasn't going to happen. No way in hell. And in January 11th, I had filed for run for office. So it's <laughs> literally <laughs> in a two-week process, my gig workers, fellow gig workers, had convinced me to run for office. Simply because they were telling me all their stories and, and what are you going to do about it? Literally, stop in the grocery store. What are you guys going to do about AB5? On the way home from recording the show, back when we got to do the sits in the studio, yeah. I, I'm picking up soda and milk. Someone stops me and asks me, what are you guys going to do about AB5? So now I'm here. This is what happened. Okay. We, you know, after, after uh, this whole process and, uh, you know, it sounds like you've You've had some interesting experiences, but I guess if 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 people just asked you again, you know, or they said, "Hey, we still got we still got to deal with this AB five. Would you be willing to uh, run again the next time if this is still a problem? Or are are there other problems out there that you've seen as well that you're interested in dealing with in public office?" Well, my f my personal focus, at least politically, is to do more of this. I'm taking my my run for office. I'm actually starting a podcast just for Sacramento. We're going to talk Sacramento politics, issues, culture, not just politics. We'll talk culture and what's going on because the the journalists, the news media is awful. They don't cover anything. It's, mm -hmm. it's one of the things I've learned is that the news media has no interest in actually informing the public about what's going on. They've got whatever their interest is. It's not actually informing the public. I'm not going to make an assumptions of what it is. So we want to do more of that. I've actually started, we're starting to develop a program to help grow the party here in Sacramento County. Um, I won't say I will never run again because I said that last year, but, <laughs> but there are conditions that it would take. Like, you know, I don't want to have to build a team again. So people want me to run. Okay, fine. You're going to have to, who's my campaign manager? Who's my, who's my treasurer? <laughs> You know, there's a, there's a handful of things that I'm not going to do because I don't like gathering signatures. You know, I don't raise money. And so there's a few things that if people want me to run again, I'll, I might do it. But you're going to you're going to have to they're going to have to put stuff in place <laughs> simply because I'm not going through that again. Not. OK. It, it's not that I didn't enjoy it. I learned a lot. I grew as a human being. I'm actually a better human being because of the experience. And I don't want anybody to, to say that I'm not going through that again as it, it was a negative experience it wasn't it was just it was an 11 month emotional roller coaster ride during the thing of covid and i just may be kind of emotionally tired right in three months i might be feeling better and i might have a slightly different perspective i will grant that <laughs> <laughs> so that's why i'm not going to give you a hard answer on that i would doubt that i'm going to run for office again but eh, i wasn't running last year either so you know what the hell yeah. I think I think one day I want to run for public office, but my big issue is going to be public education, especially in the inner cities of America. Well, it's going to be in California, so the inner cities are in California. Yes, yeah, school boards are a big thing, and they're needed. And oddly enough, here there was eight hundred thousand dollars spent between by two candidates, each spent about four hundred thousand dollars for one school board seat. Wow! Now, don't let that scare you, Leon, because two thirds of that money <sighs> is grift. It's not needed. It's just spent to spend. Right. It's yeah. just spent to spend. Huh. So you can really run an effective campaign on much less than what you think. Okay. Because much of it is grift. It's just paying off people who have sent you campaign contributions or given your party campaign contributions and blah. Oh, yeah, it's awful. It's actually worse. The grift is worse than you think. Oh, okay. The, sounds the like. And, the, and yeah, the corruption and the grifting is actually worse than you think. Okay. Sounds like, though, I mean, uh, you, you were talking about it uh, only having a few thousand dollars to run on, essentially. So sounds like you really rely a lot on volunteers then to help you out uh, with your different positions. And, and uh, you know, uh, you, you know, you talked about having uh, different different, uh, you know, staff that would uh, have to be assembled to you'd have to have your team, I guess. And uh, so it sounds like that mostly volunteers. 
Yeah, we worked all volunteers. We didn't pay any. We didn't have any paid consultants. But there's a whole <laughs> industry of paid consultants of of paid. Now there there is one person who, uh, as on a campaign, you should pay probably pay if you can if you have the money. You should pay your treasurer. <laughs> Not your campaign manager, not your not your messaging consultant. Pay your treasurer. That is the most important person in your campaign is your treasurer. Trust me. Pay your damn treasurer if you can. <laughs> well, that sounds like the key lesson, I guess, the key takeaway <laughs> if you're thinking of running for office here in in California. So um, yeah, get your staff together and pay your treasurer. Yes, if you can. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> you know, normally this is about the point in the show where we get to our knucklehead noise patrol. I think we've we've covered all the things, though. Uh, James, is there any other points you wanted to bring out before we move on, or is that uh... really the biggest point I want to run out? Is a it's a great experience. It really, despite all the issues, it you know, despite the oh emotional cumbersome, despite all the crap you have to deal with it i'm sorry someone's gonna have to edit that you it's it's a learning experience having to reflect that you're representing people who disagree with you that you're trying to asking people who disagree with you to let you represent them it, it's a different level of thought and it's it's i grew as a human being i'm a better human being now because of it and yeah. don't be afraid of because of the money because most of the money is grift and you don't actually need that much mm -hmm. It's it's so it's so ironical to hear you say that you're a better human being because you run for public office, you know. And, and I accept that, you know. Is that when you consider that I consider all politicians to be this scum of the earth, man? Well, I'm not a politician, Leon. That's the difference. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I don't, I don't feel like a lot of uh, our national politicians have grown in a good way. <laughs> this, this is exactly my point. <laughs> exactly well, see, my point. Yeah. They ran for office for themselves. I ran for office for my gig workers, and I think that's the difference. People, you know, they want to be president. I want to be a politician. I'm not, I'm not I, I'm not. I'm just, I'm just yeah, no, I get you, but I think it's a difference. I think there's a difference between when you ask to run. Free by your community and when you want to run. Yeah. I think sure. it's actually a mental difference. Fair enough. I accept that. I accept that. <laughs> Okay. Well, I think on that note, we're almost out of time. Uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, we're, this is going to be used for uh, a public access version, so I don't want to uh, overrun things. But uh, um, you know, if you if you're uh, interested in uh, you know s uh, seeing any of our past shows, you can catch them on libertariancounterpoint.com or Facebook Libertarian. Uh, and if you're interested as well in potentially being a guest in the future, if you've run for office or, you know, had other uh, experiences with, uh, you know, COVID shutdowns or, you know, may have lost your job or, you know, the riots or anything else, or you're leaving California, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, contact us at knuckleheads at uh, libertariancounterpoint.com and uh, tell us about it. And if we can, we'll, we'll have you on the show. So uh, thanks again, James, for joining us and thanks all and have a Merry mm. Christmas. Merry Christmas. All. Merry Christmas. Merry Happy Christmas. New Year, everybody. Take care. Merry Take Christmas. Care. All right, then. Bye-bye. Thank you.